Ladies and gentlemen, Nima Poppy. Thanks a lot for that intro. I felt like I was on This Is Your Life or something. Uh, <laughs> um, so today I want to share with you the concluding chapter of uh, my new book, The Prophets of Doom, Buy It Now, uh, with significant insertions and elaborations. Um, now I am aware that there are a number of people here who don't actually know who I am, believe it or not. Um, and for the benefit of them, I, I will just explain that this is the second book in a uh, prospective trilogy, the first of which was called The Populist Delusion, the second uh, is this one, the third is going to be called The Boomer Truth Regime, and the purpose of the trilogy really is to attack the kind of sacred cows and assumptions of uh, who I would lovingly call bo boomers, but, but the Boomer Truth Regime basically being the, uh, the kind of episteme, if I'm allowed to use that Foucauldian phrase in this room, um, a, kind of, uh, a kind of bubble in which everybody's thoughts and assumptions uh, rest and that nobody really goes outside of those um, that people have broadly adopted since 1945, since the Second World War. Um, so in the first book, the real target is democracy and the bottom-up view of power and of history. Uh, I really tried to resurrect elite theory, classical elite theory, Mosca, Pareto, uh, Robert Michels, people like Carl Schmitt, Juvenal, um, and various others. And in this book, I seek to do the same, only this time the thing that I have in my sights is progressive linear history. The idea that, you know, we're on this trajectory up and up, you know, to infinity and beyond, forever onwards. Um, I actually start the book with a speech that Tony Blair gave in 2005 in which he spoke as if progress is inevitable for, forever, basically, which uh, I hope to demonstrate in the book is basically madness. Um, so, well, with that, oh, and I should say that in this book I survey uh, 11, th uh, 11 thinkers. Um, I really love the idea of having a rogues gallery on the front of this book. <laughs> Um, and when I got the, the author copies through, my, my wife said, like, what is this book? I mean, this is like a kind of tea party from hell. Uh, <laughs> and I, I asked her, you know, well, okay, if you, if you were going to go to a tea party, who would you sit next to? And inevitably she picked old uh, Arnold Toynbee there. So I think, I think a lot of people would choose Toynbee. Looks like you'd like to sit next to him. And anyway, so uh, I'm just going to kind of go through... Uh, the ten points in my conclusion. I should note that as well as the nine that you see here, there are two living authors, uh, Joseph Tainter and Peter Turchin. Um, now, I haven't actually been in contact with or tried to speak to, the, to those two, but I figured that they, probably being alive, wouldn't want to be on the kind of rogues gallery. Like, uh, you know, maybe they didn't want to be next to Dracula, Julius Evola there. So, um, But they, they are also, there's chapters on those two as well. Okay, so... Having consider, uh, considered these 11 prophets of doom, it strikes me that despite many differences among them, uh, there are numerous observations that recur very often in their thought. Since most of the prophets of doom were largely ignorant of one another, that is, they just didn't even read each other, they didn't know each other existed, um, and since those who were sought to distinguish their differences, i.e., if you're going to write a book on secular history and you're not Oswald Spengler, you have to spend the entire book trying to show why you're not Oswald Spengler. This is the experience of reading Toynbee, for example. Um, um, it is logical to conclude that the convergences between them represent some aspect of the truth that is being recognized independently by different observers. Okay? Uh, now, I will list the ten most prominent of these convergences. Okay? Um, now, the first is this. The spark, the animating spirit of the early warrior caste, is distinct from the religion that comes to predominate and maintain the later multi-ethnic empire, which I will call the imperial altar. Now, I should note that these two terms here, the spark and the imperial altar, 
are not used by any of the 11 authors. I have made them up. So, you know, if you're going to go off and write your own articles, don't attribute the spark to Spengler or the Imperial Altar to any of these, because I, I just thought that they're coinages of my own, okay? Earlier in the book, I share a paper by Peter Turchin, which qualifies this statement. It showed that what they have called big gods developed chiefly as a political technology to maintain a multi-ethnic empire. Incidentally, this was also noted by the elite theorist Giantano Mosca in 1895. In other words, universal moralizing religions, like Christianity, Islam, and others, um, what Toynbee calls universal churches, which were called for him is a late civilizational development, are the product of more complex societies, the product of them. And this is contrary to what has been claimed by many scholars, uh, which is that the universalizing social technologies are actually the engines driving civilizations. We have seen throughout the study, again and again from multiple authors, that almost every civilization or empire has started with the bursting out of a barbarian group of the Bronze Age variety, who most people would think of as primitive. These barbarian groups did have religions which helped to animate them in their spirit and their zeal in this great bursting forth. But these religions were not of the moralizing and universalizing stripe. These were people who were practically believed in magic. It is the wide and awestruck eyes at the lightning bolt described by Vico, or the age of fear described by Brooks Adams, who's another writer I look at. You know, if you can imagine a kind of savage band, they see the lightning bolt and they think, oh, this is God, or something like that. This is a rather different impetus to, for example, the organized church in, you know, 1500 or something, okay? You can see that these two forms of religion are different. Um, and I don't think a lot of people pull these two things apart very often. Um, as we saw in Evola, they embodied a crude approximation of what he called solar masculine energy, a kind of vitality. For such men, religion is not universalist, but necessarily becomes particularist because they can embody nothing else. A battle of friend against enemy, of in-group versus out-group, crusade versus jihad. And when I talk about, when I'm talking about jihad there, I'm thinking of like actual Muhammad with his original followers. You can imagine fighting them, you know, there's tales from uh, 600 AD, the Persians kind of, sadly, uh, uh, I mean, it, but there are tales of, you know, uh, professional militaries facing the, you know, the original Arab crusaders and they were terrifying and they were, you know, of a completely different stripe um, from the sort of religion that you see in, a, in advanced civilization. <clears throat> Um, this quality that I'm talking about is called Asabaya and is described by Ibn Khaldun and modelled by Peter Turchin. And the lunar feminine petty moralising of the bourgeois variety against which somebody like Evola revolted like Nietzsche before him represents quite a different strain of religion that Turchin and his collaborators have called Big God, which is used to consolidate the gains made by men of the first stripe. Now, Evola called this kind of religion exterior or exoteric. Toynbee might have called it the ephemeral institution or the merely temporal institution. As Gobineau argued, another of the prophets of doom, the most forceful among our authors to do so such a universal religion may help, may help to maintain a civilization for a time, but it certainly cannot save it from the collapse after the original animating spirit of the early phase is a distant memory. 
since the universal religion was not the ultimate cause of the civilization. It was the spirit, the strength, the asset buyer of the founding elite. As this recent research by Turchin and others has shown, it cannot be expected to act as its savior. To deal in concrete terms, this is the difference between the Mongols and the Golden Horde, or the early Arab conquests and the Umayyad Caliphate, or the conquests of Charlemagne, and then later what became the Holy Roman Empire. The raiders of the early period must embody a kind of heroic spirit, while the rulers of the later period, by necessity, have a different set of problems, the problems of law, order, social cohesion to solve, especially if it's a multi-ethnic empire. If the raiders had conquered vast swathes of territory comprising disparate peoples who spoke different languages and practiced different religions, one might then see how the need for universal religion might become an imperative, okay? And the reason I'm prizing these two concepts apart is because, <clears throat> um, speaking off script for, for a second here, I think what conservatives have done for a very long time is they've tried to hold on to that second kind of civilization, the, the maintenance of a civilization. And what I'm suggesting may be happening is that we are moving beyond that point i.e., even if you try to maintain that civilization, what are you saving at this point? It requires somebody of a different stripe now to do what is necessary, okay? So, this brings us to point two. Civilizational successes, such as conquest, wealth, and education, generate their own lost conditions. I believe it was the notorious B.I.G. who once said, more money, more problems. He actually said mo money, mo problems, but I have, uh, I have anglicized it. <laughs> but, one, but one of the issues with prosperity is that it generates, this is the key problem, it generates intellectualism, a certain idealism and humanitarianism. It generates a robust education system and so on, all of the fruits of prosperity. And then, this is crucial, it mistakes those effects for causes. The true cause at root is always conquest. But as a people get richer, their taste for violence reduces. They forget that order is based ultimately on force. In elite theory terms, we get a circulation of elites of the lion variety to elites of the fox variety. Or as uh, another theorist put it, masters in coercion versus masters in persuasion. We live under masters in persuasion, believe it or not, although their powers are waning. Um, this also happens historically. So a point Vito, Vico makes, for example, who is the first of the prophets of doom and arguably the most profound, is that we tend to remember the Greeks for Socrates and Plato as being what made them great. But in fact, they were the decadent aftermath of greatness, which is captured in Homer. And paradoxically, it is the likes of Socrates and Plato who are directly responsible for the downfall of Greek civilization because of what Vico calls the barbarism of reflection. And this is a pattern noted by almost all cyclical theorists who counterintuitively see the rise of intellectuals as a sign that decline is about to accelerate. And um, I mean, the, the best kind of sound bite I've got on the Plato front, or Socrates, I mean, see Socrates coming, he's almost like a kind of ancient Greek Richard Dawkins. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it, he's, it, it, it'd be like saying, oh, well, the British were great because of Richard Dawkins. I mean, nobody would make this claim, right? But th this is what Vico's trying to say. It's like you have a skewed, you're seeing the fruit and not the, not the tree. Um, and this brings us on to the third point here. The barbarism of reflection destroys the foundations of the imperial altar and successfully kills any last remnants of the spark. The advent of intellectuals is a double tragedy. First, because the altar, which comes about, if you remember, to manage and hold together the multicultural empire, 
is weakened. It's weakened. I mean, when all the people say, you know, the weakening of Christianity has had a bad effect, they're right. This is the, the weakening of the, of this form of Christianity. Um, this is the weakening of the imperial altar, which, which does actually function as a, as a kind of social glue, okay? I'm not saying that's not important. I'm saying that we're kind of, I feel like we're past that point. And this, that ship has sailed already. The second tragedy, and apologies if you are one of these, uh, the second tragedy that is um, caused by the barbarism of reflection is because the attacks by intellectuals kind of attack the foundations and the, attack the imperial altar, it produces an even worse variety of inf intellectual conservatives. <laughs> conservatives mistake the imperial altar as the cause of the, civilizational, the civilizational greatness and seek to preserve and uphold that rather than the actual causes, which is the spark, which dims and fades and then is entirely lost. Okay, And I think this is why conservatives in all times and all places basically just have a massive series of L's. They have only ever lost. I, I, I can't think of a single actual conservative victory, certainly not in this country. Um, I mean, the conservative victories in this country were actually betrayals of their own base. Repeal of the Corn Law, expanding the franchise, you know, kicking out Enoch Powell, mass immigration. Brexit is really about a more global Britain. You know, that is, those are kind of, they're not really conservative successes, are they? I mean, they're kind of, you know, <laughs> conservative tricks, uh, if you want to put it that way. Um, the spark is diminished by both intellectuals and by conservatives. The advent of conservatives in a civilization is almost always a bad sign because they're committed to dying rather than growing. And under Spengler's principle, that which is not growing is dying. An empire that is seeking to preserve and maintain rather than expand is already dead. And in the case of the British Empire, you can actually see this directly. The moment the British Empire spawns conservatives, it basically I mean, it's gone already. Um, so that's for you guys to read in your own time. Uh, the cause is, so the number four. The cast uh, of the lion archetype, that is the warriors and the peasants, have mutual antagonisms with the, um, the cast of the fox archetype, that's the priests or intellectuals and the merchants. Now this is fairly self-explanatory, but it's worth noting the various ways in which these four basic castes combine, and it's important. In the early period of a civilization, in the upwards phase, in the kind of Genghis Khan bit, um, the spark is always set off by the warrior type who establishes order and brings about something like feudalism. Spengler notes a natural affinity between the warrior type and the peasant type. They are both lions in spirit. Um, you know, you can, I was, yeah, you can bring up your own examples. Um, it is the two fox types that cause the complications. The priests help to establish the aforementioned imperial altar, but given too much power, they will make the civilization more lunar in Evola's terms. The merchants arise naturally from the safety and order established by the warriors as trade is a natural consequence of protected borders and a large peaceful area, okay? And again, I mean, we might as well stick with uh, the Mongols. You can actually direct this, you can directly trace. Once they've established secure borders in this large area, you then get essentially the rise of a quote-unquote free trading block. I mean, it's not, it's not really a free, I, I would rephrase it. It is the, the free trade of the friends of Genghis Khan. Much like today, the free trade area of the West is the free trade of the friends of the USA, for example. Uh, so when people talk about free trade, just as the British Empire was actually, like, laissez-faire was actually just free trade of the friends of the British Empire, okay? But it's afforded in the first place by force, is, is, is the point. Um, now, as prosperity grows, the merchants invariably rise in power themselves. And there can be a period where the warriors and the merchants work in symbiosis. 
the warriors expanding, forging new trade routes for the merchants. And in the case of the British Empire, this was pretty explicit. I mean, I mean, it was a direct alliance between the warriors and the merchants. Glub calls this sorts of, sort of situation high noon. This is the high noon point. It's like the peak of power and the peak of prosperity is the high noon. But prosperity brings about intellectuals, again, who come this time not to erect the imperial altar but to tear it down. And this sort of situation can only be arrested by the coming of a Caesar, a kind of people's champion who embodies the wishes and hopes of the peasants in himself. So where the lion archetype predominates, either as monarchism, that's the warriors, or as Caesarism, that's where the peasants are. I mean, the peasants never actually rule, by the way. Uh, it's always like a somebody in plate, you know, in the name of the peasants. Uh, civilizational successes can be held in check for a period. They tend to create strong regimes through ruthlessness, but such strength ironically leads to the managerial need for administration generated by growth and complexity, which in turn leads to the rise of elites of the fox archetype again. So you can never keep the foxes down for that long, you know. Um, I mean, maybe there's some expert fox hunters in this room uh, who, who may know more about fox population management, but uh, it seems to be an intractable, an intractable problem that comes up time and again. Um, one of the issues with the lion type is that it can never maintain for long, owing to the second point. Civilizational successes lead to their own lost conditions. Nothing lasts forever. Things can be held in abeyance only for temporary periods. So the advent of Caesar is never a long, a long one thing. If you, and actually, if you look in history, it's never a long, it's never a long thing. Okay. Um, so this is the sixth point. When the fox archetype predominates, either as a theocracy, that's the priests or the intellectuals ruling, or as a plutocracy, which is the merchants uh, in charge, civilizational success may accelerate, but in the process, the very foundations that facilitated such success in the first place, that is the strong regime maintained by the lion's ruthlessness, are eroded, eventually leading to collapse. This is largely a rearticulation of what we've established already, but it's important to understand always that these effects are the function of the character and the, and the nature of the elites. The prophets of doom are also de facto elite theorists, in so much as they held this to be self-evident although several of them directly read uh, Pareto, of course, including Spengler and Evola. So this is the seventh point. Quality has a quant um, quantity has a quality all of its own, which manifests all that is mass, democracy, utilitarianism, standardization, and the destruction of quality and distinction. This is a feature of, late, of the late pre-collapse cycle. When people talk about entropy, it is something like this that they are talking about. The reign of quantity is a direct assault on all that is, is distinctive and qualitative. It's a, I mean, some of the older people in the room may remember when there were still British-made goods. Think of the average quality of the British-made good versus the average quality of the Chinese made good today, and you, you can see what you can see the general point that is being made. Its effects are always flattening, always downwards, always towards the mediocre level of the mean. This is the eighth point. Individuals of one civilizational cycle, uh, season, cannot embody the spirit of a nether. The children of the winter, for example, cannot embody the spring. And yes, I am suggesting that we are all children of winter, uh, especially those of us who grew up in the 1980s, like me. Uh, this should be self-evident, but it bears repeating. It doesn't matter how much you puff yourself up, you're a child of winter. You're not Genghis Khan. The process cannot be cheated. The great man will come when the conditions are right. And a prerequisite for producing the Carlylean great man is always some sort of suffering or struggle. I don't mean getting fired from a job, 
you know, over edgy tweets, not being able to post on Twitter for a day. I mean, this is not suffering. I mean, like, living in the mountains or the deserts just trying to survive or, you know, ha have a read of the life of some of, uh, you know, these sorts of figures one day, and you will see the, the actual suffering I'm talking about. And it doesn't really matter which kind of set of counter-elites you pick, you know, Bolsheviks, for example, were in and out of jail for, what, 25 years? Hands up if you've been in and out of jail for your political distance. Nobody, you know, or maybe maybe one of you, I, I don't know. Uh, um, uh, or, I don't know, if you, if you take the German, uh, you know, the German, uh, you know, the, uh, the Nazis, essentially, um, they had suffered in World War I. They'd all served in, the, they were all soldiers. They were, they'd suffered a, you know, world-altering humiliation on the world stage. Um, again, I don't think uh, we're there, basically. Um, next point. Civilization is incommunicable. The world feeling of a people, as Spengler says, is not transferable. What one people takes over from another in conversion or an admiring feeling is a name, dress, and mask for its own feeling, never the feeling of that other. And I've used the picture of Justin Trudeau here in the traditional Indian dress because I think it illustrates the point perfectly. Let's pretend that Justin Trudeau just went and lived in India and his kids were wearing that for the next hundred years. Would he become Indian, do we think? Would he would the Trudeaus embody the true spirit of Indian man? I don't think so. As with historical periods, so too with civilization. This is one of the most important lessons in the book, and one that many people will resist most stubbornly in spite of all evidence to the contrary. For the past year or so, every couple of weeks, I've shared a video on my Twitter feed of a civilizational outgroup in America <laughs> You can <laughs> figure out who I'm talking about in a second. Uh, some of them in Europe as well. Um, basically, you know, looting and being a pest and fighting and so on. And uh, showing the truth of this eternal claim from Spengler and from Gobineau. And all I add to it myself are the words, civilization is incommunicable. Rishi Sunak does not have, as one commentator put it recently, resting British face. That was a <laughs> thing a while back. He's wearing borrowed clothes, and everyone in the entire world knows it. That's why when he went to see Modi, it had a very different complexion from when Justin Trudeau put on this clown show. And his compatriots celebrated this fact. Now, this is probably one point that I don't need to elaborate on in this room all that much. So, uh, oh yes, and yes, the final point. Ethnicity is a constant reality which promotes in-group solidarity in the early cycle and becomes a problem for the ruling class to manage in the late cycle. Um, and yes, I am suggesting that this is a problem that the ruling class is struggling to manage. You can just look at any newspaper on any given day in any country in Europe or indeed in America. So these 10 conclusions are deeply at odds with how people have tended to think about history in the past few decades, and they contradict in almost every respect the worldview that has predominated since 1945. Yet, despite this fact, evidence from all 10 points is all around us. The church, which preceded, which uh, preaches now peace, diversity, equality, and inclusion. I'm not necessarily suggesting your church, but, you know, <laughs> take a look at some of them. Uh, the imperial altar is not the same as the church that embarked on the Crusades, which was the spark. Conquest, wealth, and education have failed utterly to solve the sorts of maladies that some of the prophets of doom were discussing over 100 years ago. On the contrary, they have accelerated them. Decades of deconstruction and cultural critique have weakened even the remnants of the already much weakened social bonds 
that held the edifice of Western civilization together during the time of Carlisle. Don't forget, Carlisle was around in 1850 being like, this place is going to shit. I mean, <laughs> you know. Uh, um, everywhere, the fox archetype rules through cunning and persuasion, although its tricks look ever more transparent and cruder as the quality of the elites has degraded. Quality and distinction are increasingly all but outlawed in a stultifying standardized world that despite crowing ever more loudly about diversity, seems to flatten and deaden anything uniquely local and particular under the leaden foot of globalism, once dubbed muck world. I remember being in a theme park a while back and I was in Mexico land. You can buy a taco. And I was thinking like, I was trying to imagine what it would be like to be Mexican in Mexico land in that theme park. But essentially that is what the kind of globalist order does to all cultures, all of them. Um, kind of makes you a tourist in your own, in your own place. Um, even as millions of people look on in horror as the social order they have known all their lives seems to collapse all around them. Even as, in the case of Brazil in early 2023, Millions flooded the streets, practically begging for a great man to grab history by the scruff of the neck. None dare step forward. The children of the late winter cannot embody the spring. Nothing says this more than the sorry image of former Brazilian President Bolsonaro sitting down to enjoy a KFC miles away from the crowd that he led on and then abandoned. I'm not making this up. On the day that those millions of people were there, he was in Florida taking a selfie, eating fried chicken. Same as Trump. Same as Trump. Same as, same, same as Trump to a lesser, to a, you know, he's still kind of in the game a bit, but the KFC, the KFC thing was just, um, this, is, this is because, let's be face it, Bolsonaro is a boomer and he is made to eat KFC and not play Caesar. Western leaders simply ignore the grim on the ground realities of multiculturalism, whether it is mass grooming gangs in the UK, fire in the streets of Paris, out of control crime in American cities. The political class still bury their ostrich heads in the sand and pretend there are no qualitative differences between peoples. Won't somebody think of the curry houses? Whether it is Atlanta London or Islamabad, their dream in the end is the same. A giant, sprawling Milton Keynes with convenient parking and a Starbucks. <laughs> and, I, and fittingly, I went to Starbucks before this talk, so yeah. yeah. Before closing, uh, I would like to, I just need to check how much time I've got. How much time do I have here? I've got a bit of time? time. Yeah, okay. So before closing, I want to touch on four difficult issues that arise out of the preceding discussion. Three are from Brooks Adams, and one is from Spengler. Now, as outlined on my chapter on Adams, he believed that the modern age may represent the end of cyclical history. He was particularly kind of depressed, I think. <laughs> Peter Turchin notably restricts his analysis to the agrarian age and does not dare to read beyond it. So Turchin conveniently stops in 1900, so he doesn't brook this problem. Let us recall the three reasons that Brooks Adams gave for his belief that cycles would end. First, he argued that modern technology and policing methods have put elites beyond attack. Second, he believed that since the world has been effectively colonized, that there are no more barbarians to supply fresh energy. Third, he believed that since capitalism was now truly global, Asia would eclipse Europe in the long run, owing to their cheaper labor and faster birth rates. And uh, his brother, Henry Adams, has got a really wonderful little logic thing where he says, um, in world, <laughs> what does he, how does he put it? In, in, in global capitalism, Asia tends to predominate over Europe and you know it's kind of it's just a kind of uh, and I think that if, if you have a look at the Chinese like if you look at if we were having this conference in China we'd be having a very different conversation if you were kind of a Chinese nationalist or something um, 
Spengler predicts a period of Caesarism which tames the money power, as he put it. However, it is not clear if this period is in fact already over after the Second World War and the fall of the Berlin War, representing the last defeats of the Caesars. Uh, maybe, I mean, you could argue Franco was maybe the last of the Caesars or whatever. In other words, has the money power won indefinitely or are there prospects for more Caesarism in the future? Now, I'll, I'll address each of these in turn. The idea that the elites are now untouchable because of technology is highlighted most memorably by the large barbed wire fence that was erected around Washington following the election of Joe, Bright, Joe, Bo Joe Biden, uh, you know, the most popular president in United States history, uh, which was dis uh, disputed and labeled as fraudulent by the inc incumbent Trump. Now, whether Biden really did receive 81 million votes in 2020 is less relevant than the fact that the idea of American leaders being put in physical jeopardy was highlighted by the iconography of the fences and the media furore around the so-called insurrection of the 6th of January 2021. On the 30th of August 2022, Biden made a barely veiled threat to his political opponents, which again evoked the idea of a violent clash between the government and the 74 million Americans who voted for Trump. Direct quote from Biden, for those brave right-wing Americans who say the Second Amendment is all about keeping America independent and safe. If you want to fight against the country, you need an F-15. You need something a little more than a gun. This led to a widespread debate, which amounted to a real-life discussion of Adams's point. Does technology indeed put elites beyond threats of physical reproach? Now, without getting into the technicalities of imagining guerrilla fighters in MAGA hats armed with machine guns up, up against F-15 fighter jets. The answer, in the end, always, and this is another lesson of history, comes down not to technology, but to will, and what Turchin has called asabaya, or collective solidarity among elites. If it came down to it, do the American elites have the will to use force on large swathes of the population? In Pareto's terms, this would signal a shift from a fox-led, soft managerial regime that relies on persuasion to a lion-led, hard managerial regime that relies on force. We actually saw one in history, the circulation from Lenin and the original Bolsheviks to Stalin. There was a good study done by, uh, back when Washington still produced good, <laughs> good material you could, uh, you could read. Uh, even then, when a regime becomes openly coercive, the need for their number to remain determined, to stay in power, and above all unified, is even greater. Now, since Adams was writing, we have seen at least one uh, enormous modern state, the USSR, collapse, and many other smaller states in, Eastern, in the Eastern Bloc likewise fall, despite enjoying modern policing methods and technologies. Therefore, we can only conclude that other modern states, such as the USA or China, for example, may also one day fall. Okay, so I say, um, next, Adams argues that there can be no more barbarians. First, let us make clear what we are looking for. Uh, Toynbee makes a distinction between mere barbarians who come as kind of carrion. So if you can remember, like, Rome was sacked a number of times. Not all of those groups are the spark. Some of them are just carrion feasting on the corpse, okay? They're mere barbarians, and those groups that trigger the spark and start a new cycle. As we've seen so many times through history, the Macedonians, the Arabs who followed Muhammad, the Mongols, the Mamluks, and so on and so forth. Toynbee also provided a model of withdrawal and return, later refined and made more ele elegant by Turchin's meta-ethnic frontier theory, which accounts for how such tightly knit groups who trigger the spark come about. They are incubated by relatively hostile conditions behind frontiers which produce asabaya. When, I, when I'm talking about frontiers, I'm talking about literally they're living in the mountains and are very difficult to attack, or they live in the des desert and nobody's going to go and fight them there type thing. Okay. Um, we have witnessed in very recent history the Taliban recapture Afghanistan from the USA. Mountain and desert militias, paramilitary groups and private military contractors 
still exist. Africa has many warlords. In fact, we've seen a number of, uh, number of uh, instances in Africa recently. Um, more complicated arguments can be made for various South American groups, especially in quasi-autonomous regions run by cartels, to provide a potential spark. In which case, we, we, we're getting to quite weird scenarios here where, like, you know, Colombian drug cartels, <laughs> like the new Genghis Khan or something, but uh, I, I doubt it. But, you know, you understand what I'm saying. Um, yet more complicated arguments can still be made for the African-American population who have faced a long series of struggles and have provided which has provided them with a feeling of uh, asabaya, in which many members of the black community see a hostile environment. Uh, the frontiers of the hood, or the concrete jungle, direct quote from a rap song, I can't remember the one, uh, it's like a jungle out there. Do you remember that one? Uh, how I keep from going under. Um, uh, yeah, they're very well documented in African-American subcultures, okay? What is key to remember is that in almost every case, the group that triggers the spark arrived in a post-collapse environment. It would be a mistake to imagine any of the groups I've listed as potentials to light the spark, taking on the US military, but rather to imagine conditions after the collapse of Western states. Now, Adams's next claim that capitalism is now global and that production would inevitably shift to China and Asia more widely is undoubtedly true. However, as we have seen, success breeds its own lost conditions, and if the East becomes dominant over the West for a period, it too will face its decline, and so on and so forth. Um, now, this may be counterintuitive, but there is a civilizational mechanism by which winning for a period invariably means losing for a period. So the saying goes, hard times create strong men, strong men create hard times, good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. While, as we have seen, there is a lot more to cyclical history than that, than this oft-repeated meme, there is also an essential truth to it. However, this does not change some difficult facts for us. The, Mal the Malthusian trap on which Turchin's model rests has been broken. Thus, it is not clear if population growth leads inextricably to the same breakdown and eventual collapse that he describes. China and India each have over a billion people and their respective states do not seem to be under immediate threat of collapsing. Capitalism is also now quote-unquote global, such that capital can be shifted around the globe with a touch of a button. The elites no longer simply represent governments, but there are a mobile, anywhere class, a globalist class, who might base themselves in any given city. This book began with one such elite, former Prime Minister Tony Blair. Whether states still have the power to rein in capital using force is an open question. It is the question that Vladimir Putin asked the world when he launched his offensive into Ukraine. In the case of China, still under the rule of the Chinese Communist Party and the increasingly autocratic Xi uh, Jinping, uh, the state quite clearly still rules over the quote-unquote money power. However, both states inextricably depend on the global trade for their survival. Only the future can tell if the current power of global capital, as represented by the Davos class, can in fact be overcome. And this brings me to the final question, which is raised by, Caesar's, uh, by Spengler's Caesarism, and whether the period of the Caesars is now over for the West, and covered the span, roughly speaking, from the rise of Napoleon to the death of Franco. We might argue that Putin and she, just mentioned, are Caesars, or at the very least strong men, but neither Russia nor China is a part of Western civilization. In Spengler's terms, they have their own culture souls and their own cycles. In other words, even if he wanted to be, Putin could not be the savior of the West because he's not of the West. In the West, unprecedented hysteria over the prospect of Trump being a fascist proved unfounded. So too with Bolsonaro in Brazil. Neither of them is a Caesar. Both are more at home eating fast food and watching sports on television. This does not necessarily mean, however, that some future figure might not be a Caesar. Now, I do not wish to speculate on this. However, it is worth stressing that our own study has shown that empire is a completely inescapable reality of human life. The independent nation state is an anomaly, little more than a political fiction. Now, this is relevant because much political chatter since 2016 
has cast globalists versus quote-unquote nationalists. But it strikes me that nationalism is only ever a short one phenomenon, which takes place in specific circumstances, such as during Toynbee's withdrawal phase. Um, in fact, the history of like nationalism is actually quite sh short, if you look at the, the long durée. Um, a large nation that can assert its quote-unquote nationalism will seldom go long without developing imperial ambitions. <coughs> Empires are necessarily multi-ethnic affairs. They tend to develop universalism as a ruling strategy, the imperial altar. As Glub outlined, the universalism of the empire tends to be designed to welcome in the conquered peoples at the expense of the founding stock. All empires sow the seeds of their undoing by degrading the founding stock over time, especially when conquered peoples are invited back to the capital. They could take a, take a look around. Uh, nationalisms can emerge in the breakdown of an empire, such as, for example, Indian nationalism at the decline of the British Empire, but such nationalisms are not a sign of a renewed spirit of a people. Gandhi did not represent a new spark for India, but rather the symptom of the weakness of the declining British power. And in fact, if you read more about Gandhi, you'll learn that there was a report done by the British Empire which showed that support for, Gan support for the nationalist cause was only at 5%. And they were like, oh, this is a problem. We need to encourage more Indian nationalism because they actually wanted to get it off the books. Uh, that's a different story. Um, uh, in this regard, nationalism must be seen almost exclusively in terms of the strength or weakness of the American empire, one of the few empires in history that refuses to acknowledge itself as such. This has some um, resonances with some, one of the earlier talks as well. A strong German nationalism in this context would be a direct measure of Amer American weakness. The most recent survey taken by a Gallup International in 2015 showed that only 18% of Germans would fight for their country. France, Italy, Spain, and the United Kingdom, Austria, Portugal, and the Netherlands all polled at less than 30%, as compared with, for example, 73% of Turks and 59% of Russians. I take this as a sign of American strength, although it would be interesting to see how figures may have changed in the years since. It is worth noting that in the same poll, nations on the frontiers of the empire for example, Finland, Greece, Poland, and Ukraine, all have higher ratings, since they are on the frontier and therefore have geostrategic importance for the USA. These higher ratings must be interpreted as being allowed for these purposes and these purposes only, i.e., Polish nationalism is a direct result of American foreign policy, okay? Uh, which is to say that nationalism in question is anti-Russian, or anti-Turkish as opposed to a genuine assertion of national interests as against American interests. The question of American nationalism is of a different stripe since um, this means withdrawal from empire. So Trump actually would mean, if he was a genuine nationalist, would mean withdrawal from empire in the American context, which is that Trump's platform offered in prospect, but it did not actually deliver, not least because Trump was never truly in power, as we now know. Seasons in history, also, it should be noticed, have seldom, if ever, been isolationists. They arrive to save imperial powers. So, just to conclude here, in my last paragraph, this book has shown the possible uses of thinking about history in a distinctly non-progressive and cyclical way. While cyclical history cannot predict the future, it can help us to find our bearings. It can give us a sense of where we are, why we are facing the issues we face, and how, on a personal as well as a political level, we might think about coming to terms with such realities. It can, in a way, bring us down to earth, keep us grounded and centred with a view to what is and what is not possible. All things must pass. Famous Boomer album. Uh, um, that we have known. What we have known must fade. Western civilization may go the way of the pharaohs, but the world will not end. Fallen powers can also rise again and have done so throughout history. The Persians, as one example, scale the heights of Cyrus the Great, the Sassanids, and much later the Safavids, but also suffered terrible humiliations by the Greeks, by the Arabs, by the Mongols. Yet, Iran is still there, undergoing, as Toynbee might say, a period of withdrawal. 
Rome has been sacked at least eight times in history. Still one of the largest cities in Europe. We tend to think of any decline as catastrophic, but collapse never means the end. A people who starts to understand themselves in civilizational terms, rather than in terms of graphs and spreadsheets, may be better built to endure. The alternative to what I have outlined in this book, which is the belief that things as we have known them since 1945, will continue indefinitely into the future for 100, 500, 1,000 years, as GDP goes up and up and progress marches on and on, should be recognized by all but the most hopelessly utopian reader as at best wishful thinking and at worst stupidity. Thank you very much. Thank you.